Well, how's it going? Marty from Anna's Anchor here. Welcome to week number two of DIY IRL. This new 32 week project that I dreamt up in my head where every week I'm going to be interviewing a different guest from a different county in Ireland that has gone out and done things their own way. And on top of that, I'm going to be writing and recording a brand new song every week. So before I start off, I really want to thank everyone that listened last week, that sent words of encouragement. There was a huge response to the episode and it was way beyond what I expected. So I really appreciate it. This is obviously something I've never done before. So it was really nice to get such strong words of encouragement. So thanks to everyone who listened last week to the episode with John. I would say that if you did enjoy last week, if you wouldn't mind subscribing on whatever platform you're listening to, leave a review, or even way more importantly, just tell a friend that you think might enjoy this because that's the best way to get the word out about anything. And it also spares me from sounding like a gal saying, like and subscribe, which is something I feel really dirty for having to have just said. But anyway, moving along. One thing a lot of people were asking me when the first episode came up was about will the songs themselves be released in some form as we go or at the end of it and to be honest don't really have a plan in terms of releasing the song separately i kind of want to keep it together with the whole podcast platform so that's the crack in that regard the song at the end of this week's episode is called poor man's kill key and when I wrote it, I had a conversation in mind that I had with a guy who lives in Dublin that I'd met in the commercial and he was telling me how Limerick is the new Berlin. And while that was probably just a throwaway statement from a gal who was completely yipped off his head, I think that really resonated with me and is a strong indication as to how the current economic climate is in both Limerick and the rest of the country. So that's that's what this song is about, and that's at the end of the episode, if you listen that far. This week's guest is the unbelievable person that is Ray Blackwell from Debarres in Clonakilty, County Cork. Ray was actually name-dropped in the last episode, funnily enough, and I literally cannot say enough good words about Ray. He doesn't really enjoy doing interviews, so I really appreciate that he went out of his comfort zone and met up with me to have a conversation. And he even says at the very start of the episodes that he fucking hates this type of thing. So I really appreciate that he gave me his time. The Barris Folk Club is a music venue in Clannacilty, County Cork. It's an amazing venue in an amazing part of the country. And I really can't stress just how on the ball the venue is like they treat you so well there is just this aura inside in that venue that you know you're in a really special place and they've had some of the some of the biggest acts in the world have stepped foot inside in that small little pub in Clonakilty and it's really amazing the legacy that they've built and that they've managed to continue so i really hope you enjoy the conversation that you have with ray blackwell from the barris float club let's do it let's get it done <laughs> <laughs> you're like put the misery out i fucking hate this <laughs> you'll be grand <laughs> all right ray blackwell how are you doing ray uh, great uh, thanks for asking how are you right. uh, thanks <laughs> okay. for coming into uh, yeah, our right. house here Jeez, yeah thanks for, thanks for having me in your home man yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's always cool to see uh i suppose to see the uh, the inside workings are the yeah the not so glamorous <laughs> side <laughs> yeah, of being yeah. a musician yeah I always feel I've done a few of these podcasts now and I always feel strange asking how people are because obviously you've been chatting well before you started sure. recording and you know how they are <clears throat> but you don't want to seem like a rude bollocks and I'm, not ask of course not we, le- like, we left a lot of gold in the van man you know yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly it'll, it'll never be captured yeah. again so Ray you're a proud Cork man but you're from or at least you live in West Cork. Sure. So the first thing I wanted to ask you, what is it that makes West Cork so different to Cork? Because from my experience, it almost feels like West Cork is nearly a different county than Cork. Sure. Well, um, I suppose I uh, I was born in Dublin. Uh, my dad is from Leash, uh, Port Leash. Um, so uh, so the first year or so of my life, I would have uh, spent it in Port Leash. But in a roundabout way, this kind of answers your question. Like, so when my dad first moved to uh, to Clannacilty, he married my mom, uh, who um, had her her family had a pub, 
and so the pub was closed down and long my dad was a plumber originally and um in the 70s he uh, he um you know I suppose during the recession in the 70s and stuff like that he was having a lot of problems um getting paid for uh, work and all this kind of crack as well to, to to pack it up so long story short he did a few plumbing jobs down in, in the pub in the barras and uh, he ended up taking it over so um so to answer your question what makes uh, west cork so special uh, my dad always said it was the blowins uh, it was the people who came into the area and uh, they were a, they were a big um a driving force i suppose in uh in making it is what it is today like and uh, clan kilty would have a, a a huge uh legacy of um and tradition of people moving there and them driving it on like Noel Redding yeah. um, Roy Harper uh, Donovan lived in West Cork for a long time and like and that's just the musical side Paddy Keenan and you t- like today you have like David Mitchell and and all sorts of authors and yeah. you know uh, so there was always a kind of a bohemian kind of um, air to the place which was I suppose like Leonard Cohen said like pebbles in a bag polish each other so there's that kind of vibe yeah. there, like you and, know so and what is it that has drawn those the likes of those people to West Cork yeah, and Clannacilty I mean I suppose it's it's kind of always been off the beaten track a small bit um, there's you know beautiful scenery you've beaches you've hills you've woods you've um, it's 45 minutes from Cork City maybe that's a factor but um, I don't know I always think there's some kind of a magic kind of magnet or something like that that draws people to it yeah. like but you know, if you believe in magic, like. yeah, if you can look too far into things. Um, and so, was the Barras before your father took it over? Did they have music? Like, was it associated with being a music venue, or was it just a pub? No, it was just a pub. It's just um, like, um, and sure, you, you've you've played in the Barras and you, you've seen it. Uh, just literally the front, the front shop front. Yeah. Um, you know, so two hundred year old building. <clears throat> And uh, and that was it. You know, I think there, there used to be a bakery at the back of it, or. Um, um, but uh, again, it was just a, a kind of a, just a, an old kind of a pub, and um, back in the day, my grandfather would have also been one of the first kind of started up one of the t- taxi services in in the area, like you know, and he would have had had a kind of a taxi, um, that would have kind of worked out of there, like you know. So yeah, um, yeah literally that's it. Just as, as you see, the front hasn't changed too much, like uh, apart from I suppose a few aesthetic things, but um, just uh, as you saw it. So yeah, so no music, and then. My father moved to Clan and he befriended some musicians, I suppose. And um, he used to, the first musical gigs were as you walk in the door on your left, if you're familiar with that, yeah. kind of snug there. So that's where Noel Redding would have played originally, and a lot of the you know Paddy Keane and a lot of the trad lads and all that kind of stuff. So that's kind of where it started. And you you were always working in the bar, kind of growing up. <sighs> yeah, yeah. So like I would have when the bar when my dad opened up the bar. My mom was working in a bank and she was in uh, Abbey Leaks in Port Leash. So my dad would have been kind of up working in the barras and then we'd drive up on the weekends after mom finished work or whatever. Uh, like I have a vague recollection of it, or at least I think I do. Yeah. I suppose maybe I've been told so many times, I think I remember. Yeah. But um, so yeah, so that was it. And then we eventually moved in with my grandparents and my uh, uncle who lives uh, in, upstairs above the bar. So uh, we lived there for a few years, okay. just upstairs. Yeah. At what point then did you move on to ultimately running the place? Yeah, well, I suppose I went to college and then I lived in South Korea for a while. I was working over there and then I came home just just for a visit. But um, I can't remember, like, whatever whatever happened anyway, it was never my intention to stay. But I, I kind of got caught kind of working and then um, it, it just kind of just finished out a couple of months and then something else happened maybe there was a member of staff that had left or something like that or I can't I really can't remember now at this stage but uh ended up just I mean I remember I ended up started working back in the kitchen when I first got there and then um just kind of progressed or got demoted to the bar whatever way you want to look at yeah, it like, you okay. know, just, but like I'd, I'd always worked there all through since I was very young whether it was sweeping the place or cleaning it or, or sorting out the the bottles and returnables and all that kind of crack so it was always I suppose it was always just part of my life I suppose like you yeah. know did you find it hard then because I suppose working in a bar is a kind of a, a trade that's transferable to a lot of places but I mean the bars is kind of a music venue like no other so did you find it hard then moving on to actually booking the music then Um. well <clears throat> I suppose 
yeah, that definitely was was hard but I suppose because mostly because um, it was a lot of the stuff that was out of my sphere of influence like my outside of work like you know like I mean I loved like Nirvana was my, my big band and I loved all that kind of stuff and I suppose in lots of like I had uh, like Noel Redding and and all these musicians would be coming to my house f- for dinner and I was like they're my parents friends I didn't want to be hanging out with them at all like you know I was yeah. like fuck this um, so uh, I suppose there was in the early years there was a kind of a rebellion against that like you know but um, as far as booking the shows I suppose uh, like a lot of people would have been getting in contact um, that would have played there over the years a lot of the folk folk guys that like I never really even heard of like you know so um, it was a bit of a, a learning curve and that but I, I got to to be f- familiar with, with I suppose all sorts of different types of music and uh, like I was always conscious that um, that I was you know like keeper of the flame or to some to some end that I had to continue what had been going before me yeah. so I had to learn a lot I suppose regard, certainly re- regards different types of music and acts and stuff like that that I wouldn't have been very familiar with but it's it's been amazing so I, I've got yeah. to hear some some great guys and you know all the old folkies um, you know like a lot of them now have become friendly with over the years as well like you know kind of hopefully carrying on the, the relationship that my father would have had with them as well like. yeah and you just kind of touched on there about being into different types of music and for me from the outside looking in you know, I'd always heard of the Barra's folk club and yeah. I'd seen you know like Mick Flannery or the Villagers or or those kind of posters okay. like flying about the internet and then sure. eventually came to learn that you're like a massive Fugazi fan yeah but how did you kind of get into that type of music well that's really cool because like like it's cool that you mentioned those two bands in particular because like Mick Fennery's first ever gig was opening up for John Spillane and then his first some of his very early shows like you know 20 people in them like and Mick and Connor from the Villagers are two bands that like I suppose when I when I took over the bars I always feel that the, the table was kind of set but you still have to cook the dinner Do you know like that's the way I look at it and those two bands in particular were of my generation and they were bands that I saw kind of first hand you know maybe 30 people at the first villagers show even before the villagers be- were the villagers uh, the, me- the immediate played in the bars you know like uh, Connor's old band so okay. that's what I love and I suppose that's what maybe defines my uh, caretaking of the bars if that makes sense like uh, that they were my generation and they were, you know it was great to see them at the start and to see them where they, where they are now like yeah. but um regards so i mean like if you ever listen to the immediate like you know like uh i suppose the way they used to swap instruments and and really you know it was kind of like i imagine like you know sebado or whatever like you know and so those lads are definitely coming from and mick as well like you know a big nirvana fan and yeah all that kind of stuff i don't know if he's but um so that was maybe that was the generation like you know that they were all influenced by them to some end but um but yeah again i suppose back to Fugazi yeah. <laughs> like um, the, the first first time I ever heard of Fugazi I was reading I, I, I like I was a big Nirvana fan and I bought a book called Route 666 The Route or The Road to Nirvana or something like that and I had a picture of Nirvana on the cover and it was just about I suppose American hardcore and the build up to Nirvana and how, and, and I know there was an interview with um, uh, Eddie Vedder and I think he talked about Fugazi and, but you know back then that's how you found music is that yeah a band mentioned them in an interview that you read in some magazine or something like that and then you just you had to, you had to buy go up to, go up to get the bus to Cork and go to Comet Records and buy yeah. try and uh, buy the, the record so and were they a stocked Fugazi they did yeah like, I, so like I, my, I got a cassette of Repeater in, in, in Comet like that's okay. that was literally that kind of started really? then like okay. you know and then you know like anything you just you, you, you're just voracious for it like you try and track down the back catalogue and all the rest of it and, but um yeah and then the first time when I first moved to college I was living across from Nancy Spain's and Fugazi then were playing literally across the road my first year of college uh, I think it was the Red Medicine tour and uh, like that, I just couldn't couldn't fucking believe it like you know All right. they played in Nancy's Spain's yeah yeah, right. yeah that's insane yeah it was great it was unreal yeah going back to the bars then I'd say being kind of well obviously you're a music lover but being into heavy music can it sometimes be difficult to book bands that the punters want to see versus who you want to see yourself because let's say if I was to run a venue I feel like I'll probably run into ground because I'm into such obscure sure. music that not the general kind of population are into can that be a difficult thing 
well I suppose when I started it was I was always conscious of the legacy and what was there and what went before and I tried to continue it but then you know like the the, the more maybe the more confidence you get or or, or whatever that you and 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 the, and the more the longer you're at it something you want to put your own mark on things so um I certainly would have booked he- heavier bands or, or stuff that that mightn't have been there but um but then, like nobody's nobody was as loud as Noel Redding. Sometimes, like yeah, you know, so that's the other yeah, side that's of where it all kicked yeah, off. Yeah, so there was a lot of rock always going through the place. Yeah. Like, you know, like I saw some amazing rock stuff there, um, and like uh, I suppose, yeah, I suppose you want to put your own mark on things and stuff like that. But then, when you start getting running, you, you can't run away with yourself either. I always have to remind myself that I suppose the bars first and foremost is a pub. It's a traditional Irish pub, and that's the reality of it. And it's kind of a music venue. You like. Uh, second in, in as far as the day-to-day running of it and how and why it functions and why it's still here today like you know mm-hmm. so i've had to you know that's been a learning curve as well but um you have to, you, you know you you can't you have to do what's right for um you know business-wise as well like yeah. you know and that's that's not always it certainly wasn't always easy uh in the early, early days but i suppose it, it's more um it's something that I'm just, I suppose, more conscious of knowing and certainly something that I have to pay more attention to as well. Yeah, and I suppose for anyone that's, that will be listening that isn't aware, like obviously Clonakilty is, you know, it's relatively rural anyway. It's not, you know, it's not a massive, you know, it's not in a city or anything and you find a lot of smaller venues, even in major cities, you kind of constantly see that they're, you know, finding it difficult to, to keep the doors open so the, the barras would even put on gigs that are of the you know of a similar stature or size that bands would you know that, that would be kind of sticking to the main cities is it i suppose this, you're, you're probably going to say yes but how difficult is it to run a venue of your size not in a major city uh, well look i, I suppose like a, a big part of why the bars is what it is is because of obviously the 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 people who come to the place and the audiences and stuff like that like clan clan is a small town like four four and a half thousand people um but you know there's there's a good hinterland um it's only 45 minutes from cork which works in our favor uh sometimes um for the most part i suppose we've been around long enough that we're part of a gigging circuit or whatever Mm. um so uh that's the other side of it and i like to think that we have a reputation for doing things right we have a great sound system we've great house engineers easy load in and load out um you know in the last couple of years we've um we have uh, uh an apartment for for bands to stay in and stuff like that and, and bands are, are treated uh, well when they come down so i mean that's definitely stood in our favor as far as why people want to come come to the place um and we just try to make it as easy as possible but um like i i don't think it's always kind of you know maybe the elephant in the room when you're talking about a music venue but like definitely it's it's getting harder i feel to to get people into shows certainly new shows and i don't think that's just the bars doesn't matter if you're the bars or or dolans or wherever like you know um and like i've been to gigs in you know in in established venues and there's not a lot of people there but it's kind of something that you you can't kind of you can't talk about like you know or you you can't say or the band can't say it because everyone wants to present this image that um oh we're great we're really popular um oh we're a great venue this is the best place to come if you're a band but um i definitely think it's getting a bit harder like you know yeah there's almost this kind of weird like stigma or shame about fucking playing a gig to like four people but but you a hundred percent yeah i thought that happens uh, like i was like jesus i remember seeing the enemy in dolan's and there was literally like 10 or 15 people in the warehouse mm. but it's kind of law of averages sometimes it just doesn't click and there's other things on and it's the wrong night like it's it's not really a measure of yeah you know, oh like uh, i totally agree with anything. you there's there's so many variables now when it comes to putting on a show and doing a gig and like you have to know firsthand from from your experience as well like uh, regards <laughs> that like, like there might be a charity function like especially in a small town um there's oh there's a, a charity for down the road or there's a table quiz for this really popular member of the community like you know and like that does take away from it to some extent like you know yeah. but um but yeah I suppose again it's just it's trying to manage from from my end from what I try to do is just try to to manage that just try to exactly exactly like you were saying have the right thing in the right time and uh like certainly this time you know we'd reduce our music schedule just because we can't sustain like 
we can't sustain doing a load of new shows and stuff like this at this time of year because people don't really go out in January or, or they certainly are, are less open to going out like you know and yeah. they have it in their heads that they're not going to go out and, um, and I, I love I love when that's wrong like you know but uh, that's certainly how how I, ma- I try to, to manage um, the, the music venue aspect of, of the bar like you know and sometimes you have kind of quite big bigger acts play I suppose well going back to the villagers but I suppose that's a relationship that you've nurtured from the beginning can it be challenging putting on uh, you know a, a very big act that is going to sell out the bars immediately in a smaller venue or is it just business as usual and it's good crack um, like I mean it's it's amazing and like like those are kind of prestige shows uh, for us um, but um, I suppose the biggest the, the biggest problem with, with those big acts is that you have everybody who's ever gone to a gig ever is turning up when the, the show is sold out saying oh man I need a ticket I, I'm coming here all the time I'm a regular and like that's that's literally the hardest part for us is to manage that um, you know because th- these people are like like there are customers day in you know that might be every once a month or two months but they're coming in to the bar part of it uh, you know trying to uh and at the end of the day, it's such limited tickets for those shows that, like, we'd love to be doing a week of those kind of events, but it's not the case. But um, but again, I suppose over the years, maybe we've gotten a bit, a bit better with that, and you try to, you know, you're always trying to look after all these people, like, you know, so. Um, but no, but, like, that's that's amazing when that happens. Um, and uh, it's always a special uh, special occasion, especially in, in the intimacy of, of our room to see acts like that. Um, on, a, on such a small kind of stage like you know it's, uh, it's yeah. great yeah it's amazing and yeah. the, the venue is so perfect for it there certainly is a just an amazing feeling in there and I think that's probably largely down to how you've run the place and, and the staff and yeah, how and everyone like, gets looked after well yeah that's a part of it too and I suppose like I always like to think that uh, performers leave their own little mark in it as well like you know they kind of the place becomes imbued with the performances or yeah. whatever, like you know, like even seeing we, seeing the pictures of of different acts that have played on the walls is is yeah, yeah really it's, nice it's, to it's, see. It's pretty wild. It's pretty wild. <laughs> it's the it's the it's the pic, it's the 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 acts that have played that haven't that aren't on the walls now is is might be concerned at the moment because there's been some amazing stuff that I haven't <laughs> been able to get pictures of or or, or yeah. get up on the walls. So, but um, no, it's 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 been great. Yeah, been very lucky. Taking a turn, you're sitting in front of me wearing. Clonakilty International Guitar Fest T-shirt, which not not by design, by the way. That yeah. was, I just showed it. Just happened. I was wearing mine <laughs> yeah, yesterday, no, actually. Okay, yeah. uh, so, <laughs> what's it like putting on the the festival? I suppose it's very unique in the sense that it involves the entire town, and most of the shows are for free. I imagine that makes it very difficult to to put on. So, so what's it like organizing it and getting enough funding so that you can make all of these shows accessible and for free? Um, I suppose we're it's fifteen years now at getting to the stage that we're at, so it's been uh, uh, long and, and and hard and uh, you know I suppose we've we've learned very quickly over the years as well, which to my colleague and myself you know um, uh, Kevin McNally how uh, regards funding funding is always difficult. I suppose we do a lot of uh, you know trying to get sponsorship and 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 um, raising funds in the town and in the community as well um but then uh, i suppose like we're uh, reliant on arts council funding and Cork county council funding and lots of other uh, creative ireland and all these other kind of uh, avenues again it's only from over the years from going to workshops um you know meetings that seemed pointless um that we've been able to climb up that rung of the ladder of, of funding so um again that's been kind of um something that you know that we've, we've just we've worked hard at to to follow through on regards um i, I suppose the a, a big well one of the one of our but like part of our manifesto is to try to make things as accessible as possible for people you know we i suppose it, it grows from the belief that um I sp- again in the debaras model that the best gigs or the small gigs or certainly stuff that um or uh, even things that you may not have you know, some of the most memorable music moments are a, a band that you mightn't have known about or heard about and that, that blew you away, like, you know, so that's yeah. kind of part of our uh, philosophy in the festival. We That's how we, part of the reason that we, we keep things free, also because we're using the town as our kind of venue. Um, There's not, there's a lot of, like, places that aren't established venues that aren't even close to being a venue that we turn into venues. That contributes to the, the experience of seeing a great noise rock band in, you know, in a, 
a, a shitty old man's pub or whatever like yeah. you know, it just kind of adds to the occasion or yeah. um was that a conscious thing is that kind of goes goes very back closely to the kind of fugazi well like I, discord mentality of just do it wherever and sure like i, I mean i think I suppose if you're into if you're into that kind of stuff, it, it does kind of uh, inform a lot of different parts of your life, like you know, and um, definitely like that'd be a part of it. Um, just the the, the do it yourself uh, kind of um, mentality. We haven't done any gigs in a you know in a state penitentiary or anything like that yet, or in the local yeah. uh, jail cell. You know, but, uh, um, <laughs> Close enough though, butchers. No, but you've and... given me a few ideas, like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, but again, that's just the. It's just it's just such a. A bizarre kind of experience and like i suppose like i don't want to do it too much but like i've i always i always feel that uh like uh there's a lot of kind of magic realism in clan kilty like you know in west cork in particular it kind of yeah. really like it lends itself to that kind of you know um uh so seeing a butcher seeing a, a gig in a butcher shop isn't you know i just it just seems to fit like you know i don't know it seems to make sense yeah is the festival a good opportunity to book bands that may not make sense to have in the bar of a Friday night but that you still really want to have play yeah 100% like it's I suppose the festival is just kind of in lots of ways it's just a, an open card for for being Kev to, to book music that we really love but also like there's so much work goes into like into the booking and into um the lineup, you know, and or how like which show follows the next show, um, that it all has to make sense in 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 that scheme of things, um, like uh, but also I suppose like the festival began because of the bars, you know, we called in a, a lot of favors and a lot of musicians who would have played in the bars, but like in in recent years, it's just a, a, I've it's a way that I want to introduce maybe new bands to a ready-made audience that we can follow up with a show in the bars, you know, after it, like, you know, um, so that there's, there's always already a base, you know, that, that, and that people will come back and yeah. they might've seen them for free, but they'll come back and, and pay into a show the next yeah, time. So it's kind of that it. kind of long-term kind of a, a goal. So like, we're always kind of looking long-term in that, uh, in that yeah. sense. Yeah. That is a great stepping stone to kind of build something from. Aside from music then, because obviously like most people in their downtime, they'll go to the pub or they'll go and watch live music and that's kind of that's your most of your life is consumed with that so what do you do outside of that in your downtime um yeah well i suppose like i have a family and stuff like that like you know and i love uh, try to spend as much time with them as i can um uh, I have to say that and uh, yeah yeah <laughs> just fortunately they don't they don't listen to podcasts at all so yeah. no. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, um so what is um uh yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I like, I like, I like going to pubs and I like meeting friends and I suppose um, uh, I like watching movies. I suppose you know, same as anyone that's really computer games. I like computer yeah. games. You know, you're into David Lynch movies, yeah, aren't you? I'm a big, big David Lynch fan. Yeah, yeah. Did yeah. you watch the new Twin Peaks? Uh, I did actually. Yeah. I suppose I wasn't. I was never really into Twin Peaks, but I was always like really into David Lynch since I was in college and you know maybe a little before that certainly his movies um, but uh, when the new the new season came out yeah I loved it actually I really really loved it, it was yeah this is yeah. definitely going like really into the creepier stranger okay, side of yeah. things yeah yeah no I love uh, I just I love I, I, it's, it's it's real escapism for me I, lo I love that world that he is able to create and draw you into like you know in, yeah. uh, it's pretty it's pretty special for me and anyway. I enjoy it speaking of crazy stories and the Tojo the Monkey is very famous oh, right, at, yeah, at the yeah. moment in, in relation to Clan of and okay. just to briefly explain to people that haven't heard it, Tojo the Monkey was a there was a World War 2 plane that came down near Clan and with American soldiers and they had a, a monkey captured and the the monkey came to the bar with the soldiers in kind of until they fixed the plane and the monkey ended up dying a sad death. Yeah. Uh, do you, <laughs> I, I just personally find it hilarious that, it, that he's celebrated and kind of guilty whereas I feel like if something like that happened now it would be animal cruelty all across yeah, social know, media. Yeah. yeah, for sure. What's your yeah, opinion sure. on Tojo the monkey? Well, I suppose it's kind of it's kind of again like talking about magic realism and stuff like that. Like, you know, yeah, that's what that's what exactly. made me think like, of it. That's just that sort of shit just kind of seems to happen around where, where I'm from, um, or where where, I, where where I'm currently from. Um, like and like I suppose so. There was this big American bomber, and they the radar stopped working, and they kind of 
they flew off course and they crashed into a marsh uh, on the way out to uh, Inchidani and like and as the story goes um they popped out of, the, out of like they didn't know where they were they thought they were uh you know um I don't know did they think they were in maybe occupied Netherlands or Sweden somewhere or like somewhere, there, or, or yeah. the north yeah somewhere like that so they popped out and with their guns and there was and uh they there was a local kind of farmer or whatever walking past and uh they pointed the guns at him and they said uh where are we and uh your man said oh you're in White's field, but don't worry, he's gone to Cork for the day, he won't be back till tomorrow. <laughs> so I thought, like, that's kind of the, which I always thought was kind of a funny kind of a story. <laughs> but, um, the, uh, yeah, so Tojo was there, and he was kind of, it was a, it was a, it was a big deal in uh, in the town at the time. Again, I suppose, like, Ireland was neutral, so um, the, uh, there was, uh, I think, some guards were sent down from Cork or whatever, was there soldiers to, to, to guard the, the Americans um, wh- uh, but it just became a big party in the town and it became a, like just a big kind of session really like as, as I've been yeah. told like, <laughs> and uh, like uh, apparently well I don't like I don't know Toja was given some local delicacies and all that kind of stuff as well like you know and like nobody obviously had ever seen a, a mo- fucking monkey before yeah. like, you know, so it's pretty exciting but he did, he did pass away and uh, I'm not sure if you've been to the hotel in Clan O'Donovan's but uh, there was um, it's an old really old like like a great hotel a yeah, great family there's a nightclub, there well, there's a nightclub there. at the back yeah, yeah. but um, in, you know it's a real old lobby with a big stairs going up uh, from the lobby and like they waked Tojo at the top of the stairs like and the cube came all the way down and <laughs> out the door to, to see to see the, the dead monkey like you know after he passed away but um, which again is kind of bizarre but yeah so he, they had a big I think it was a there was a big uh, a couple of years ago was it, was it it must have been 60 or 70 years anniversary or something like that and uh, a lot of the the former uh, the guys who who came in the plane kind of came back or else members of their family came back like just mm-hmm. to market and yeah just a, a real quirky weird kind of a story yeah. like, you know having spent plenty of time in clan over the last few years like hearing a story like that makes total sense and okay, yeah. can understand exactly why that would happen in clan like uh, there's there's also uh, a friend of mine started up the Tlanakilty uh, brewery uh, company and one of their beers is Tojo you know it just tells yeah, a little bit yeah, about I've the, seen in the shops yeah tells a little bit about the story and the label but um, I know he's gotten a lot of uh, well <laughs> some uh, like Tojo is a derogatory term for a Japanese person apparently yeah. like, you know so he's like without even realising that like you know he's <laughs> gotten a lot of irate emails and, okay. and, and Facebook posts because of that just, just another kind of funny kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Speaking about just completely fucking strange things then, like, Clan is an interesting place in West Cork. Has there been any ridiculously strange characters coming to the pub and you've just thought, oh, man. Oh, what, what fucking planet did you, did you come nice. from? Yeah, it's like, you know, you is feel like anyone that stands out? You feel like you're part of your own David Lynch movie a lot of the time, but um, <laughs> loads. None really that, that comes immediately to mind, but, um, you know, like, I suppose what, like, Clan is great for... Uh, uh, being very welcoming to kind of everyone like you know yeah. so so you know madness is kind of encouraged to some to some point anyway certainly yeah. like you know or uh, or um, certainly tolerated but you know like obviously there's there's lines that certainly in the bar that are, if they're crossed that's you know we'd be very um, you know we'd be very strict in regards to how people carry on in, in the pub like you know yeah. so um, but other than, I can't think of any anything particular yeah. has there been any musical highlights then I'm sure there's been tons but is there any like one that stands out in, in your mind oh like there's been there's been look, there's been loads really I suppose but I know when when Lee Ronaldo first played the guitar festival he'd been an actor we'd been trying to get for, for, for a long time and um, and then uh, he ended like he eventually said decided he was going to come like that was pretty amazing and then as far as the gig went I suppose the whole circumstances about the show how it happened were pretty amazing um, I suppose I was constantly trying to to book him for, for a few years um, like he'd be one, one of my you know I'd be a huge Sonic Youth fan and yeah. uh, so um, and then as it turns out his book like Sonic Youth's booking agent in uh, in Europe has always been this guy called Carlos Van Hifte and like from the early days when back when they were in, first started coming over the, so he and as it turns out he's also Luca Bloom's uh, booking agent and all, oh, has right. been in Europe okay. and uh, so he just kind of event- I kept on trying to 
book uh, Lee Ronaldo or whatever and uh, eventually he just said look just look he got in touch with Luca Bloom and said look, there's this guy in a folk club that's trying to just keep sending me emails about Lee Ronaldo like you know <laughs> and then Luca kind of said oh they're great it's a great yeah. spot blah, blah. so from that folk connection you know Lee Ronaldo came to, to, to the bars like you know and it happened at a time when uh, our fet, like I was pretty f- fed up with the festival um, and certainly running it and uh, a few things had happened that you know that I was, just wasn't going to just had, had enough of it mm. but then he said he was going to do it and like that totally reinvigorated everything and just spurred us on and um, you know like and that's the first like and it's been huge for us and that like we can that was our that was part of our calling card then anytime we um, contacted anyone else oh like Lee Ronaldo's played oh you know, that opened up so many more doors then for us yeah. too like you know so so in so many ways that was uh, really important really special but then he came to the folk club and like he hung his guitar off the ceiling and just fucking unplayed it for like 45 minutes which was pretty amazing as well <laughs> for, uh, for certainly for half the audience and for me yeah <laughs> <laughs> losing your mind yeah I don't know I don't know um, but uh yeah, like, and I love, I love that. I love seeing the venue being used in different ways, and like, again, just part of that, just subverting expectation or what, or a folk club or, or you know, just kind yeah. of whatever. Like, it's cool, and like, uh, I know we were we were talking about, uh, like Berkeley earlier, like you know, like um, and like I, like like those Berkeley shows were, were were pretty amazing when they first started coming to the bars, mm-hmm. like you know, and and uh, like they had a massive following now in Clan, and uh, like. We all got on really good, like and and like Tommy would always kind of tape over the 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 kind of uh, lateral line in folk in the folk club, so it, it and uh, or turn turn the folk on the wall into rock club, like you know he just oh, yeah. kind of like tape it up to make it look like that. So that was always it was kind of part of it too, like it was. Cool. Yeah, it's in, it's interesting having the the folk club label on it. Yeah, like the way I look at it, and I suppose the way a lot of people, uh, like um, like Louis Armstrong said, all music is folk music. I never heard a horse sing a song, and I mean, I I I really agree to that. You know, it's just people telling stories. You know, and that's what folk is like at the end of the day. Like you know, yeah, for sure, and it is just a word at the end yeah. of the day. Yeah, if you had a, a a magic wand and you could book one band, that's current at the moment. Current bands. In any band at all in the world. I was going to say Leonard Cohen, but I know I don't have an answer. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Well, we know what your answer is if it was past. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Sure. Well, like, Fugazi, they're only on hiatus, like, you know? Yeah. I believe, like. Yeah. I believe, like, all ages show, no water, no drink, no problem. You know? Um, uh, I mean, they have come to Ireland. There is the. Yeah, uh, again, I saw them on YouTube. uh, They uh, played the Savoy Savoy in the. Nancy Spain's man. I saw them Nancy Spain's. I've. I saw the evens as well when they came over, um, uh, and like like you know like back in the day I've emailed like like Ian McCoy and all that kind of crack like you yeah. know and, and like fuck it he got back to me like you know it's yeah. just amazing, um, and uh, and then a mutual friend uh, or a friend of mine was living in in Washington, and uh, one day she just she emailed like Discord House or whatever like, and uh, she said oh. I have a friend who, you know, he's a big fan, blah, blah, blah. And whatever about that, he, he was like, oh, come on, come on up to the house, call, call over the Discord or whatever. And uh, and then she was telling me that he sent a load of, another email, like, oh, like, if you want milk, bring your own milk. Like, I, I, don't, I only have soy milk, you know, and yeah. you know, all these kind of stuff. Just no to, So uh, she went up to, over there anyway, and they had a massive chat, and uh, they were, and uh, he gave her a load of, like, a letter and, like, stuff, signed stuff, which for me sent it back to me like you know so Unreal. like uh, like he's he's the god man he's the dude yeah for sure yeah and I suppose cool. that is the, the mentality that we we're kind of talking about and that's kind of what the premise of this this podcast is it's kind of interesting that you'll still meet people that might have nothing to do with that side of music or have any interest in it but they still kind of hold those same values true and it is very interesting meeting people from different lines of work, even outside of music, that kind of, sure, that yeah. are you know, really just trying to look after everyone and do things for the right reasons. Yeah, like, I suppose, I don't know, I don't even know, like, anymore, am I a music fan? I'm actually kind of a people fan. I like yeah. meeting people, I like nice people and good people. And I suppose that you want to be, you'd love to be, uh, I suppose, acknowledged as one of those, like, you know, or, uh, you know, so, 
yeah, that's what's that's what's fun. Again, that's that's the great part that, that I love is just meeting people and people that you might even think you have stuff in common with and you do like, you know. So. Yeah, for sure. It's the best part of it. Yeah. I suppose just to finish up then, obviously there's going to be Guitar Fest this year. People can find out about that on the Debarra's website, is it? And also at clanguitarfest.com. Okay. So yeah, the dates for this year, the 16th to the 22nd of September. Um, the dates for next year are the 14th to the 20th of September, I think. So um, that's kind of where we're at now. We're just kind of trying to, we're kind of looking two years ahead, like, you know. Oh, so, wow. um, okay. Uh, the fifteenth year of the festival uh, this year, um, we've f- some acts announced, but we've a lot more to come, so it's going to be yeah. great. Yeah, awesome. And I suppose with the bars itself, obviously people can go out and and go see the gigs if they're in their locality. Is yeah, there like, any way that people can support the the venue or find out more about well, it? Just if they're from abroad. Just, uh, www. Um, I suppose just just go to a show or call in or go to a show somewhere. And That's lastly, it. I just want to say thanks so much. Thanks for coming on and talking to me, and mm. thanks for everything. I speak for a lot of people. Thanks for everything you've done <laughs> for music. I mean, the amount of effort it takes to put <laughs> sure. in, and like when you're, you know, for other people's kind of dreams and ambitions, you know, it is, it's a big ass. Like, and I yeah, really, I really appreciate it.